Hi there, I'm Ken Lammers. Welcome to Minor League Matters. And today, I'm going to, as one ignorant American, try to explain to other ignorant Americans what little I understand about cricket. And so, let's get cracking. Okay, so I'm an American, and North American, United States American, however you want to say it, which means that I've never played cricket, I've never seen it live, I've never uh, known anybody who's played cricket. Uh, I do understand, you know, well, I live in a hemisphere where I don't think barely anybody plays the sport. Yeah, I think there's probably some people in the Caribbean and maybe some people at the fancy up north schools, you know, like Harvard or someplace in Connecticut or something like that, right? But not generally played in the United States. Uh, it's not even a tertiary sport in the United States, right? There have been attempts to start professional leagues, and they've all pretty much flopped. I think it's tried two or three times and really hasn't even got off the ground any time, right? It's kind of a shame. It, it looks like a fun sport, uh, but it just hasn't got going. Primarily in the United States, you know, you hear about uh, cricket being played. You know, it's, it's some throwaway line on uh, ESPN or some Fox Sports show, and they say, you know, in a test match in uh, Brighton yesterday or Melbourne or Mumbai, uh, you know, such and such team from you know, the Australians beat the South Africans, you know, 492 to 456. And the match only took four days. And you're sitting there going, what? You know, and then all this does is contribute to Americans going, holy cow, you want to talk about an offensive-oriented game? We love offensive-oriented games. That's great. Uh, on the other hand, you know, with Americans who have been griping for years that baseball takes too long to play and have finally caught to the fact that football takes longer and has more dead time than baseball, you know, uh, really a you know, four or five day game in cricket yeah, it just doesn't, it's not American. It's not the kind of sport that's going to catch in America. Um, and you look to see where the sport has really caught. It's caught in places where the British Empire reigned, uh, with the exception of Canada. But you see it in Australia, New Zealand, South Africa. Uh, you know, it apparently is massively popular in India, Pakistan, the subcontinent, basically. Uh, and, of course, England. Uh, it is, you know, massively popular. It's popular all through those countries. The only part of the empire that really didn't catch on uh, is in Canada and I'm going to say that Canada got inoculated by the presence of hockey I don't have a lick of proof for any of that but it makes a good story so I'm going to stick to it uh, United States of course Mr. Naismith's game uh, came along and yes while well, I was obviously you know inspired by or you know he had heard of cricket, obviously, to kind of get it going. Uh, it, it took different paths, and uh, but it has filled the slot that cricket does in uh, in many countries. So let's talk about what uh, what we've got here. Uh, let's start with what kind of field cricket's played on. Cricket's played on a different type of field than anything I've seen before, right? It's a huge, grassy circle. Uh, figure an American football field and then another half of an American football field, and it, it'd be in a big circle rather than a rectangle, right? Uh, and around the big circle uh, is supposed to be a rope that goes all the way around the circle. Uh, although apparently now they use, you know, styrofoam barriers, you know, little barriers or whatever that are about four inches tall, right? Uh, and that marks the boundary of the field. And all of it is a big grassy thing except for the 
exact middle, which is where you've got something called a pitch, right? And the pitch is somewhere between 60 to 70 feet long, or at least it is between the two wickets. The wickets, as you see this diagram below me, uh, it talks about stumps, right? And the stumps are the bottom part of the wickets, the three sticks that stick up, and the wicket are the three sticks and two things that's, that are on top of the, sit on top of those sticks. So that's where the wickets are. And that narrow rectangle's there, and there are two lines on that narrow rectangle. Uh, one is the line which the wicket's on, and I think that's called, that's called the crease. And then slightly in front of that, there's another line and that line's important for uh, batters and uh, out for reasons of getting outs and that sort of thing. And we'll get to that a little bit later. So this is the field. It's a big, massive, circular field. It's an interesting, uh, interesting to look at stadiums for cricket because they're just a big circle. Uh, I'd say it was the only sport that did circles, except I think Australian rules football is a circle too. So... Uh, it's not quite alone, but it may be the biggest sport in the world with huge circles. And now let's talk about the time period of play, right? As I understand it, there are different types of cricket now. There is the old-fashioned cricket, which is called test cricket, uh, and that was the five-day-long cricket. Could go five days, right? Uh, in more modern times, uh, to in order to update it and make it playable on TV, they have other forms of cricket, which in in which they limit the number of throws that can be made with the ball. Right, it's the equivalent of limiting the number of pitches in a baseball game. If you said only 150 pitches can be thrown in a baseball game, that's about the equivalent of what they're doing here. Right, they're limiting the number of throws that can take place in a uh, in a cricket match. Okay, so, but I'm going to kind of fall back on the old school one with the old school rules. There are only two innings, however, and, and at the beginning of the game, a flip of a coin or some other random way, it's chosen which order the first inning will be batted in. So the visitors could start, the home team could start uh, the first inning. You never know. Okay, then... The, home t the team that's batting bats until there are 10 outs, right? There's 11 players on the team, and because of certain offensive reasons, you have to have two offensive players on the field at all times. Uh, if you can't fulfill that, well, then you're done. So there have to be 10 outs before the side's done. And it is much easier for a hit to occur in uh, cricket than it is to get an out. So this can take a long time. You hear things about people getting 40, 50, you know, 150, 200 points scored by one batsman. And we'll get to why that is in a minute. But, uh, you know, it can go for a while. And uh, you have to complete the entire, all, both innings uh, for the match to end. Or you have to complete an inning and a half. And if the team that would bat last is is ahead, obviously, they win. But uh, you have to complete the innings to end the match, right? If you do not complete the innings to end the match, then it's a tie. It doesn't matter what the score is. It's a tie if at the end of the five days they're uh, one team still batting, right? And so that's, uh, for that reason, the team batting doesn't have to just get out they can also, uh, in order to end their half of the inning, they can just say, okay, we're done. Their captain can just say, we're done, and put the next team up to bat. Okay, that, so that's a way of shortening innings. And uh, in, from what I've been able to figure out, even in the five-day matches, most of the time the fifth day didn't take place. The fourth day was iffy, so you're probably talking a day to three days really and then maybe a fourth and then really rare occasions five you also have to understand that this isn't uh, that there was time period that within which the game was played in a day and as I understand it and I'm probably getting this somewhat wrong the time period started at 10 a.m. 
and went to 6 p.m. and uh, there was a break for lunch and a break for tea time. It is a British game, so you got to make allowances. So there's a break for those, and at the end of at the end of 6 p.m. it's over. Now I'm sure that that's changed some with television and all that, but uh, that's that's basically the way it, it's run. So 10 to 6 for a number of days that cannot go longer than five. With both teams trying, well, at least the team that's ahead, trying to make the game come to an end so it can win. And the other team can keep trying to keep the game rolling so that uh, they don't lose. It's an interesting concept. Okay, so now we've talked about the field and the time. Let's talk about the basic equipment. Here's your basic equipment for uh, cricket. You have the bat down here right below me that is you know it's not it doesn't look like it came off a lathe like American bats do it is flattish um, although it appears to be a, a, a bit of a curve in them a uh, little bit of a scoop but uh, the bats flat fronted and boy they can if they can get a hold of a ball and it's coming slow enough they can turn it all sorts of directions which is you know, an interesting thing about uh, this mat, this game, is that you know there are no foul lines, so you can hit the ball if you can scoop it and throw it over your shoulder, uh, and it goes wherever it goes. That's just as valid as if you hit it forward and straight ahead. Uh, you know, any direction you hit it, you see a lot of guys if they get a hold of a slow pitch that will try to throw it at 90 degrees. Right, so that they can, uh, you know, throw off the defenseman, that sort of thing. Okay, so the ball here is this thing in the center. It looks a lot like a croquet ball, uh, but I went and looked to see what they're made of. It looks, in many ways, like a baseball. You know, rubber core, kind of rubber things around it, rubber band type things around it. Big difference apparently is that it is on the outside. There's a plastic ball cover, and then around it is sewn the leather. And you see here that it's not sewn the way an American baseball is. It is sewn so that it is around the circumference in one in uh, just one seam. Uh, it's kind of interesting thing here. It's apparently harder than a baseball, and they don't use gloves. Well, with the exception of their their catcher and analogy. Eh. Their catcher version that uh, does have gloves, but nobody else does, so uh, it can make it a little bit hard to catch. And this thing here on the right is the wicket, right? We've talked a little bit about that before. The three sticks coming up off the ground are called the stumps, and I can't remember what the name of the two two things across the top are. The two things across the top are really the important part because knocking them off. Uh, is a way you get a lot of outs. So, you know, the stump don't really matter. If you touch the stump, great for you. You got to knock the things off the top to get out. So, that is one of the more important pieces of equipment on the field. Uh, beyond that, like I said, the uh, the person that is their uh, their version of a catcher, he gets to carry have two gloves. Nobody else does. And the batsman generally has what looks like a miniature version of an NFL helmet on his head so that he doesn't get his head clobbered by the rock-hard ball. Okay, let's talk about offense. How do you score in cricket? There are basically three, well, there are three ways you score in cricket. Uh, when the ball is thrown, the guy who's the batter, uh, in this thing they call it a striker, uh, tries to hit it. And generally does. I mean, most of the time the ball is hit, right? Uh, now, there are two offensive men on the field. There's the batter and across from him next to the other wicket. The batter's next to one wicket and next to the other wicket is the non-batter, but who's also an offensive guy. Think of him as a man on base. Uh, he's there, but he has to be there. There always has to be two offensive players on the field. So, how do you score? Well, the guy who's batting, if he hits the ball and 
it goes all the way through through in the air and lands on the ground on the other side of the rope that's outside the entire field, that's six points. You hear him call that a sixer, right? If he hits the ball and it rolls across the ground and hits the barrier, hits the rope, or it bounces across the ground and goes over the rope, that is uh, four points, okay? And the third way of scoring is a little bit more complex. If the batter hits the ball, but it's not going over the, it's not going to hit the rope or go over the rope in the air, then uh, he and the other guy that are standing next to the wicket will yell to each other, run or stay, or run or stop, or something like that. If they decide to run, they have to switch sides, and if they get to the other side, that's one point. Then they make a choice again. They can switch sides and run back again. That's two points. And they can keep doing this forever as long as they can keep doing it without getting out. So one, two, one, two, three, four, five. It gets ridiculous. You obviously can't get that far without getting out after a while. Interestingly enough, uh, the way that you are safe is if you get your bat, both players have to be carrying the bat, across the line that's in front of the wicket, right? Not the line the wicket's on, but the one that's in front of it. You have to get your bat uh, across that line to be safe, and it, which makes it very interesting to watch people who are on the offense in cricket run because they run with the bat out in front of them like this, right? Uh, because the bat, it's not doesn't matter if your foot gets across that line and the, uh, they get you out, you're out. If the bat gets across the line and they do what has to be done to get you out, you're safe. So you run with the bat forward, okay? And those are your basic ways of scoring. You can get six, you can get four, or you can get as many as you can get by running back and forth, right? And that's how you score in the match. Interestingly enough, say, you know, you've got one batter and he hits the ball and they just switch sides once, right? Correct? Uh, you switch batters. Because this guy now becomes the batter. Uh, and this guy is just here for him to be able to run to make scores, make runs, right? And so anytime you get an odd number of runs, whether it's one or whether it's one, two, three, you know, you switch batters then. So... It's an, that's an interesting rule. Uh, I also understand, well, we'll get to defense in a bit. But that's how you score. And uh, it's pretty simple scoring. Uh, then you end up with defense. Now, defense has 11 guys on the field, right? I mean, it's a massive field, so 11 doesn't cover it all. And you have to choose where you're going to go and what zone you're going to cover. And I'm sure that it is a sabermetrician's dream, right? Trying to figure out, well, this batter hits here. If he's thrown this kind of pitch and he hits to this distance and all that sort of stuff, I'm sure they love this sport to death for that sort of reason. But let's talk about generally how it happens. You have nine guys that are deployed by the captain Anywhere in the field, he decides to deploy them, uh, which means, you, interestingly enough, you'll see guys off to the right and left of the batter so that he can't hit them at 90 degrees and, you know, get free points. Uh, you may see somebody other than the uh, catcher type guy. You may see another one behind him if, if the batter's got some mad skills and can do this and shoot balls over his head. Uh, but uh, And you'll see some guys that are out in front of the batter to, to catch the ball. There are two guys that are not generally involved in this nine-man shuffle. They are the wicket keeper, or the catcher, basically, and the guy who is called the bowler. The bowler is what we Americans would call a pitcher, right? Uh, although the way it's done is very different in uh, cricket. There's the the, uh, the bowler uh, doesn't have uh, a mound he has to be on. 
There's no rubber he has to keep in contact with, nothing like that. So before he throws the ball, he can go as far back as he wants, back to the rope, all that, and run all the way up and just heave the ball. Uh, he has basically two rules about it. One rule is that he cannot crook his elbow more than 15 degrees. That's why you don't see American-style baseball throws. You see this thing where they come over their head, right? They don't, they don't curve, they don't hook their elbow. They just throw over the head. So they'll run up all the speed and they'll do that, right? Uh, secondly, he has to uh, hit the ball on the ground before it hits the wicket, right? So he will throw to the ground, bounce it up, and they can put all sorts of wicked spins on these things and that, depending on how some of them throw really hard. You know, it's just like baseball. you got some guys who are control guys and some guys who throw like Chapman, right? And so that's, that's what they do. Uh, now, pitchers or bowlers only throw the ball six times. That's called an over, right? They only throw the ball six times, and then somebody else has to take over. And when, interestingly enough, as I understand it, if you're if you've got one guy over here who's bowling, throwing the ball, and he throws for his over his six pitches, then the next guy has to throw from over here, and for his over for his six pitches back this way, which makes a kind of interesting interplay. Um, so, you know, who's batting and who, <clears throat> in which direction they're batting from can change depending on uh, where, where the batter, you know, batters run to and where the, when the pitchers change. So that's, a, that's kind of an interesting mix. So we've got the, uh, we've got the guy throwing the ball, uh, the bowler. But, but behind the wicket that the bowler is throwing at, there is a uh, wicket keeper or catcher basically back there, right? Now he's back there, as I understand it, for, he can be, if he's really good, he can take place in getting the batter out, right? Uh, but he is back there in large part because, as I understand it, the batter doesn't have to hit the ball to be able to run back and forth and get points, right? Uh, if the uh, if the ball were to skip past the wicket and never be touched by the batter and roll out into the field, um, I think even if it rolls to the doggone uh, rolls to the doggone rope, I guess he'd get four points. But it rolls out to the field, the batters can just start running back and forth and get points. So that's why you keep a wicket keeper back there. And yeah, he's the only guy on the field with gloves, and he's generally got two. They look like oversized um, uh, soccer gloves, right, that goalies wear. Uh, but he's back there doing that. Okay, so now we've got a general layout of how the game's played and where the people are. Now let's talk about outs, right? Because like I said, you know, obviously this sport is built up so that you get more hits than you do anything else. Uh, but have to be outs if you're going to get 10 guys on a side out. Here's some of the more major ways of getting out. I think there are more obscure ones that I don't know about, but these are the major ways that people get out. First of all, there are no balls and strikes here. You know, you either hit the ball, and whether you do anything, you don't have to do anything when you hit the ball. You can stand there. If, it's, if the ball goes five feet out this way and dribbles off, and you know there's no daggone way in the world you're going to get back and, you know, and get a get a point this way you can just both you and the other runner can just yell at each other no 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 and stay there and you don't lose you don't get any outs right and there's no tag outs like baseball and that sort of thing no force outs uh, what you do get is this uh, first of all if the guy throwing the ball hits the wicket and knocks those two things off the top of the wicket that's an out right uh, so he's going to try to throw it past the batsman with speed, strength, hooks, curves, whatever he can do to get it there. 
and uh, the batsman tries to stop him, right? Which leads to a second way of, of getting it out, which is called leg before wicket, okay? The batsman is not allowed to play goalie, right? He can step forward and hit the ball, uh, and as a matter of fact, a lot of times they scoop it, right? And he can use the bat to try to stop the ball, but he can't use his legs, which is kind of interesting because they wear huge pads on their legs, but he can't use his legs to try to stop the ball. If he doesn't hit it with the bat and he sticks his leg out and stops the ball, that's called leg before wicket, and most of the time you hear him just say LBW, and that is an out as well. Uh, their version of the umpire has to call it, and, but he will. I've seen him called. So that's another way of getting out if, you, if your uh, batsman suddenly decides to play hockey goalie. Third way to get out. If the ball is hit and it goes into the sky and it is caught before it hits the ground, right? Which is interesting because, like I said before, it is a ball that, I think it's harder than a baseball, and uh, they have to catch it with their bare hands, no gloves. Uh, now, there may be some exceptions to this, and I'm not sure the nuances of this, but as I understand it, if they catch the ball and then run over the rope, I think that might be four points, right? So they have to stop themselves short of the rope or throw it back into the field short of the rope if they're going to run over it. Uh, I've also seen guys jump out of bounds uh, and before the ball hits the ground throw it back in and that has stopped uh, you know six points from being scored or four points from being scored uh, as long as they're not touching the ground when they grab the ball and throw it in that appears to be okay uh, I actually saw one where the guy jumped out of bounds uh, jumped past the rope jumped in the air grabbed the ball and threw it back in and another guy caught it then so that it was an out and so I, I assume that it doesn't matter where you start uh, if you start past the rope you can still if you jump in the air or not touching it you can throw it back in but I'm not sure on that uh, I'm just telling you what I've seen okay so that's three ways of getting outs a fourth way that an out can be gotten is if somebody is running right Okay, so batsman hits the ball, and they're running back and forth like this, right? Um, as the batsman's running towards the, uh, towards the wicket with his bat out, trying to get across that line in front of the wicket, if somebody from the defense throws and hits the wicket, knocks the thing on the top off, or throws and it is caught by one of his teammates who then runs over and knocks it off, before the batsman gets his bat across that line, that's an out. Okay? So we've got caught in the air, LBW. Uh, we've got pitch hits the wicket. And we've got uh, the running back and forth out. Uh, let's see, what else is there? There's two others that I know of. Uh, one is double hitting the ball. You are not allowed to hit the ball more than once when it's thrown to you. So you can't just pop it up in the air and go whack, right? Uh, that would be an out. You have to hit it with the, you know, the first time you contact the ball. Um, and the last way is that uh, the batter, when they bat, quite often, if not always, will move forward of the line in front of the uh, wicket. You know, there's the wicket line, the crease, and then that line in front of it. The batsman will will quite often, if not always, when he goes to hit that ball, he'll move in front of that line in front of the wicket. If that ball then goes past him and doesn't knock the wicket over, wicket over and is caught by the wicket keeper, the, their version of the catcher, the catcher can run up and knock off the things off the top of the wicket. And if the batsman does not get back across that line before the catcher runs up and knocks the top of that wicket off, he's out. So uh, you would think this is an unusual thing, but apparently there are a couple guys who are catcher types 
who I'm sure in conjunction with their pitchers are really, really good at this. And uh, you can see replays on this sort of play if you go and watch YouTube. But uh, I think I've covered all the major forms of outs. Caught in the air, uh, hit by hit, the wicket gets hit by the pitch, uh, the, uh, the batsman plays goalie and gets a uh, leg before wicket, uh, double hit, the uh, caught running back and forth, the wicket's hit while you're running back and forth, uh, and put out by the catcher. Uh, that's the ones that I understand. Now, I understand there are a few more obscure ones out there, but those are generally, I think, the ones that you're going to run into in a match. You may run into some others, uh, but I think these are enough to really get you started understanding what it is. Okay, so strategy. Obviously, this is, despite the fact that it's kind of confusing because... You know, I've never played it. If you're an American, you've never played it. You didn't grow up with it. It's really kind of a simple game, right? Yes, there's terminology that you're not used to, right? And it looks weird because you're not used to a big circular field and all that. Um, and watching the play is different than anything you've ever seen. But it's a simple game. Now, this is true of most every game in the world. You know, soccer is a simple game. Baseball is a simple game. Football, basketball, you know... Uh, they're all simple games, with the possible exception of hockey, because you have to learn to skate before you learn to try to kill each other on the hockey rink. But, uh, you know, that may be a little bit more difficult and is a reason to actually admire Canadians. Uh, the, uh, but all sports are pretty much simple at the beginning, and then obviously you build layers on that. You have skill, you have strategy, you have all this sort of stuff going on. And in cricket, like I said before, the sabermetrics must be nuts trying to figure out what zone that people should be deployed in to catch the balls, where this guy most likely hits, and all that sort of thing. Uh, and I'm probably sure it goes the other way too. Batsmen being told, well, if this guy's here and you do this and that, you can hit better. I'm, I'm sure it's a sabermetric dream, right? Trying to figure out deploying people, who, who what, where, when, how. Uh, but uh, beyond that, there are some over, overweening uh, kind of strategy things. Uh, I Again, I don't have a nuanced understanding of this sport, so I'm missing all sorts of things, I'm sure. But two things kind of come up. You know, one is the, uh, the captain of the team may decide to stop his team from batting anymore, because he doesn't want them to bat so long that time runs out, right? So if his team is, you know, both teams have batted once, his team is batting uh, at the or at first in the second inning first, and uh, he has a, you know, 800 to 50 lead, he may then just decide, no, that's it, we're done. Uh, we're not batting anymore. We're going to put you up, Right. And the reason he would do that is because he's trying to get to the end of the match. If he doesn't do that, he just keeps scoring and scoring and scoring. At the end of the match, despite the fact that he's got you know a gazillion runs, the other side's got 50, uh, he doesn't win. It's still a tie because time ran out. So you would try to position it so the other team would, uh, you'd have an opportunity to get all 10 outs against them and end the match, right? That's one kind of strategic moment. Uh, another kind of strategic moment is uh, if you are you know, start out the first inning and let's say the home team bats first and the visitors bat second and the home team gets 450 points and the visitors get 25, right? Uh, at the beginning of the second inning, the home team can elect to start batting at the beginning of that inning or to wait until after the visitors have batted and that way you can put the visitors to it uh, and uh, if you put the visitors to it and in the match because you know if they're still behind when you get all their guys out even um, then there's no reason for you to bat at the end because you've won already right so that's what uh, 
you might do, particularly if you thought time was going to be tight. You know, you've scored 800 runs, and you've taken up two days, and then they took a day to get their 50 and uh, or their 100 or whatever, and then you uh, might choose to put them back on in the fourth day so that you can get the match ended because you know that if you batted next, you'd score another six or 700 runs and probably take another two days and run out the clock. So there's some strategy there in which you just basically, uh, you know, let them bat twice so that you can, uh, so you can win the match, right? I am sure there's a lot more strategy to this than I am missing, but again, I am fairly new to this and do not have the nuance. If you want the nuance, go hunt up a Brit or an Indian. They probably got nuance. I'm just trying to give you the basics. Okay, so that wraps up today, right? Uh, if you have comments, leave them below. I am sure that I got a million things wrong today or slightly misunderstood or whatever. Leave comments. Tell me, or more importantly, tell other people who've seen this video, wait, no, no, he, he needs to understand this, that, and the other thing, right? Tell them that. Please try to use as little uh, terminology as you can. Try to make it generic so regular people can understand. Uh, as I always say, I will try to read any comments that anybody makes. I, however, cannot promise that I will reply because I've got that day job. It's a pesky thing, but kind of need it for the money. And, uh, you know, if you like this video, hit like. If you like this, everything you're seeing around here, subscribe. And then go watch every video about 9 million times because that's about the only way you can get monetized in uh, YouTube anymore with the new rules. <laughs> Wonderful as that is. Uh, and I'm going to leave you with one last bit of advice. Go watch some minor league sports. And I will catch you all next time.